Take your Bibles, please, and turn to the first passage that you read this last week, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. By the way, you might not be reading with us, you might not be reading where we're reading in the Bible, but please hear me, I hope and pray that you're reading. If you're not reading your Bible, you're starving. You are starving to death spiritually. And you might think, well, you know, I feel fine. I'm sorry, but we're talking about spiritually. Mama Green, good to see you here. How's mom doing? Very well. Okay, we'll talk more about that later on. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Look at verse 3, if you would, please. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Is it not true that our gospel so many people cannot see? You can speak to them about it. You can, you can plead with them. You can pray for them and praise God for prayer. But you share it with them and they just, you know, they don't see it. By the way, Satan is in the business of blinding. If he can't blind you to the gospel before you get saved, he'll blind you to the, to the call of the gospel after you're saved as we'll see later on. Verse 4, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Please hear this. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Now, now hear that. We preach not ourselves, you know, when it comes to the gospel, there's one thing that there is no room for, you and me. I'm talking about our pride. Because we are to be the living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which Paul says is our reasonable service. There's no other way to cut that. There is no other way to cut that. <coughs> Excuse me, there's times when we wind up going through the spiritual warfare, seeking to get people, by God's grace, to understand the call. And sometimes it's, it's not, it, it just isn't there. And by the way, I'm not talking about a call to vacuum. I'm talking about a call to call on those that don't know. There are people out there without Jesus Christ. And it so saddens me when we see people in the media and in entertainment and in the news that, you know, they, they epitomize that with the silliness that winds up going on in the world. It is so very sad. For we preach not ourselves. We don't have to have it in our own strength. Praise God for that. Believe me, I am so glad for that because quite honestly, right now, I'm not trying to get a pity party. I'm exhausted. But it was, you know, I, I thought, Lord, really? You know, my mom on her deathbed and a week of meetings, really, Lord? Yes. Okay. And you know what? God's grace is sufficient. He's sufficient for what you're going through too. For what you are meeting. But there's something that we need to understand here. If we are going to preach Christ, we must know Christ. And I'm talking about more than just simply knowing him for salvation. That is but the beginning. That's why you need to be in your Bible. There are things that you need to understand about our God, about our Lord and Savior. <coughs> Excuse me. There's a place that we were at just a few weeks ago on Wednesday night. And I heard a message from this, this passage, and I've alluded to it before, a little over a year ago, but it was in our reading this last week, and it just absolutely dovetails perfectly with what we have here. So I want you to go back to the book of Exodus. Please go back to Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17. I love this passage. This is absolutely tremendous. Remember, we were, we were learning on Wednesday night, those of you that were here, we were learning about the name of God, Jehovah Nissi, the Lord our banner. 
Well, this is, the, this is what takes place here. Again, I've talked about this. We've preached on it already. Here were the Jews coming out under Moses' leadership. Look at verse 2. The, pil- the, chil- the people did chide with Moses, give us water to drink. And he said, <coughs> excuse me, why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? T- uh, wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? That word tempt there means to put to the test by doubting. You're not going to really do it, are you? I don't know if you really can do this. And so what happens after all this? The Lord gives Moses direction. He's going to go to the rock in Horeb, and he's going to smite the rock. Look what takes place right after this happens. Look at verse 7. And he called the, pla- the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the chiding of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Then came Amalek. And you remember, I told you back then, and I've mentioned it before, that Amalek is a picture of the flesh. We've got a new nature, but you've got a flesh as well, and that flesh is fallen, and that flesh cannot, will not be converted. When you trusted Christ, you're still dragging along baggage. You are set free from sin, like we were told this last week. Sin shall not have dominion over us, but you know something? You wind up dealing with it. You put yourself on the sacrificial, you know, on the table as it were, but the sacrifice keeps wanting to get up. Then came Amalek. You're going to wind up having Amalek come to you. I don't know what your Amalek is going to be, what the challenge is going to be. It could be a physical ailment. It could be a personal struggle. It could be anything. It could be disobedience. It could be apathy. It could be some sin that, yes, a besetting sin that has you. But the fact of the matter is, you will have an Amalek come. You will. We are not going to have, in this life, complete freedom from sin. We're not. There is coming the time, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Just before I came out here for the morning service, I was in the office, I was praying, and the phone, my my cell phone uh, rang, and it was a, uh, it said no caller ID. I've gotten used to that because when we get that, that's usually from hospice. And so I answered, and sure enough, there was a lady on the, on the, um, on the other line, and I started telling her about mom, and she goes, praise the Lord. I said, you're a Christian? Amen. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I thought, hot doggies, man, this is great. So we're, we're rejoicing in the Lord for a few minutes and then hung up, and I thought, man, that's good. I'm so tired of talking to these people and going, well, you know, you just never just know. I know. Let me talk to you. In fact, Let's wake mom up and she can tell you. (laughs) But I want to give you two points. And this has very much to do with what we're going to be looking at going back to 2 Corinthians, not only chapter 4, but chapter 5. Please hear this out. I heard a message, (coughs) tremendous message, from Wayne Shemesh, who was a, uh, a, a, a pastor in Brisbane, Australia, and went as a uh, missionary to Thailand. And he was there at Brother Fisher's church, and he preached this message, and he had two points, and I thought, this is fantastic. Number one, please write this down. You cannot choose what comes. You cannot choose what comes. The fact of the matter is, you don't have a choice whether or not Amalek comes. The Bible says, then came Amalek. They didn't invite Amalek. Amalek came. And there is going to wind up being people that will assault you. There will be battles that will go on within and without. And here's the thing that I personally have found. That the greater challenge with your Amalek and with mine is internal, not external. It's It's the battle in the mind, folks. It's the doubts and the fears and the worries and the anger and the bitterness that want to come up. Then came Amalek. You cannot choose what comes. 
I would not choose for my mom to be under hospice care. I wouldn't choose it, but she's there. Sean would not choose for his father to be there, but he's there. Other people have challenges. It's there. Then came Amalek. You cannot choose what comes. But here's the second point. Please write this down. It's not what's present. It's what prevails that counts. It's not what's present. It's what prevails. What happened? Moses told Joshua, you go down, you battle with them. I'm going to go up yonder, and I'm going to hold up. And remember, the, the rod wound up being, that's the banner. And Aaron and Hur went up and helped him hold his hands up. Why? Because if his hands started sinking, Amalek seemed to be winning. If he lifted them up, Amalek was dead. I mean, God's people were winning. There is going to be war, according to this chapter, there's going to be war forever with Amalek. And what a perfect picture. You are never going to get into a state, as long as you have this flesh on, you're never going to get into a state of having total victory over sin. By, by that, no, let me back up. You don't have to sin. But like we heard and we were reminded of this last week, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen? Amen. Man, I'm telling you, you know, you hear stuff like that. Some of you, I wish you could have been here. I wish you would have been here Amen. this last week, especially Friday night. What a, I'm telling you, what a way it was to end up. It was tremendous. Amalek will come. You cannot choose what comes. But praise God, this can take place. It's not what's present. I don't know what your Amalek is. You don't know what mine is. But it's what prevails that counts. And guess what I find out? Guess what you find out? We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And sometimes we wind up going to that place of victory in tears, in pain, and yes, sometimes even regret because our faith falters, but we can get there. You see? We can get there. And so we've got to remember this. There in, this, is, this is reason why we've got this focus, because now I want you to go back to 2 Corinthians 4. If, in our, if our walk and our trust in Christ is going to prevail instead of just simply being present, if it's going to prevail, we need to know Christ. We need to know him. We were challenged, and I mean, again, just greatly challenged. One day we are going to give account, and we'll be there in just a bit, but one day we are going to give an account Look again at verse 5, chapter 4. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. Listen, that means that wherever you go, you're saying something. Hello? Amen? Amen. Wherever you go, you're saying something. You know, I, I, I'm telling you, I was so glad for my mom. My mom couldn't stop talking about Jesus. She couldn't stop talking about the Lord. It was so sad. I heard of somebody just recently when they saw family members come in and talking about the Lord, the nurse said, I had no idea your family was so religious. Nothing was being said before. Folks, we preach Christ. Listen, we don't preach conservatism. We don't preach Republican or Democrat. Mankind's going to let you down. Mankind has been letting you down this last week. We do not find our hope here. Our hope is set firm in heaven. And praise God, one of these days we're going to be there. I want you to listen to this. Please understand this. Paul's joy and passion was this, that he knew Christ. It wasn't in his education at the feet of Gamaliel. It was not in the wealth of his family. And we know they had it because of where he was from. He said in Romans 8, 
Verse 31, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Listen to that, please. No wonder we can have an attitude of gratitude, right, brother Jacob? Right. Colossians 3, Paul said in verse 10, well, excuse me, verse 9, lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free. By the way, you know how you take care? You know how you take care of racial problems in America? You know how you take care of it? Number one, you remind people there's only one race the human race. Number two, in Christ, guess what? There's no free, there's no bond, there's no, nobody's from Rio Linda and nobody's from New York. Did I say the wrong thing? No, but you understand what I'm saying? You understand what I'm saying? People, you know, people all over the world now, they, they, they know Rio Linda. You know, they've heard of, oh, about, you know, a bunch of hicks. Well, praise God, <laughs> we know him. Listen, the point is this, there is, there is none of this. There's no caste system in Christ. Christ is all, he says, and in all. You see that? That's why we can have, in, in Israel, we can have Jews and Arabs coming together and loving on each other and talking about, you know, talking with each other and praying with each other because they believe in Messiah. That's why you can have a multiracial, quote unquote, church in America like this one because we believe in Christ. Praise God for that. He wrote in Hebrews 7.25, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. You ought to sometimes just listen to Paul talk. Hey, Philippians 1.21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. The man knew something I want to know, that you ought to want to know. Christ is all. He truly is all in all. But in order to preach Christ, you need to know him. Preacher, would you shut up? I've already trusted Christ. Are you reading about him? Are you studying him? Hey, listen, are you praying to him? Are you coming to him? Colossians 1, 27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I was reading something on the death of, of churches that's taking place. On average, there are still 200 churches closing every week. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. There is a church that I came from. It's now running 12. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. We have Christ. We need to go to his throne. We need to lift him up. We need to rejoice. He is the one that we glory in. That's why we have things like we did this last week. And why we don't say, no, just because of a burden, we're not just going to have you Sunday on, and on Wednesday. Uh-uh. No, 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 no. We're going to have it all week. Christ in you. Listen, 2 Corinthians 2.14. Put on your Pentecostal face if you need to. Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. Hello? Praise God for that. Let me tell you something. I, I want to tell you a couple of things, okay? And then we, i got a couple of more things I want to tell you. And then after that, there's a couple of more things. I, I, I didn't think I was going to be preaching this long. Forgive me. Can you hear this, please? You, you, know, you know how you get excited you look at Christ and you realize this. Number one, Christ is who he said he is. Amen. Amen. He is who he said he is. He stared men in the face that to them, they had the power to put him to death. No, he came to die. But he says, yeah, thou sayest it. I am he. I am he. 
You know, we think about these verses that we love to hear at Christmas. Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us a child is born. Yes, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of what? And meanwhile, the world has fallen apart, and we've got the answer. We preach Christ. I hope and pray that you get an opportunity this week to preach Christ. I hope you can tell somebody about it. I hope so. But here's the thing. He is who he is. He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. But would you please turn to Luke chapter 6. Turn to Luke chapter 6. Look at verse 46. Now, this is sobering. Look at verse 46, Luke 6. And why call ye me, what? And do not the things which I say. And then he gives a very practical lesson. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He's like a man which built an house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock, but he that heareth and doeth not. Let me ask you something. Is it possible that there are things that are preached from the word of God? It doesn't have to come from this preacher. It can come from anyone. Is it possible that there are things that are preached and you gently and ever so quietly set it aside. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I'll leave that to somebody else. Awake to righteousness and sin not. But you know, you have to have a little bit of sin just to spice up life. That's damnable heresy. That really is. I just read... Now, I, you know, I, whatever churches they went to, I don't know. But I just read on an average, 68% of men in churches are into pornography. Men, if there's a man in here that is looking at that stuff, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to stop. And I know the battle can be big. That's why we have our you. That's why you can humble yourself enough to get away from that stuff. But you young men especially, you hear me. That stuff is disastrous. And be sure your sin will find you out. That is wrong. Yeah, but you know, I, I got to have this computer. You don't have to have anything. If thine computer offendeth thee, cast it out far from thee. For it is better for thee not to have a computer than to have a computer and destroy your life and the people around you. Let's remember that. Christ is who he said he is. Number two, Christ does what he says he will do. Think of the promises. I love this quote from Jim Berg. Anything that God has stated as a certainty, we can trust as a promise that he will order his universe according to that promise, excuse me, to that statement. I love that. Anything that God has stated as a certainty, we can trust as a promise that he will order his universe according to that statement. For instance, he's with you. He is with you as he promised. Matthew 28, 20, and lo, I am with you always. Catch that. Always. He's here. Let that sink in. That is not some kind of ethereal thing that you just, you know, you're, you're, you're going after like that. That is not true. There's other passages that I have. Hebrews 13, 5, I, he said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. He will meet your every genuine need. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you. Philippians 4, 19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You can fellowship with him, your Savior, at a moment's notice. 
Psalm 55, 17. Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. Psalm 91, 15. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. You got trouble? He'll be with you. Sean, he's with you. He's with you. And you don't have to wish him to be that way. He keeps his promises. He will show you his love and grace. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. He will be more than enough for you today. Listen to that. Again, Romans 8, 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? I rejoice in that. Wow. No wonder Paul could say in verse 17 of chapter 4, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. Listen to that. But you know what we also read this last week? We read what our brother preached Friday night. Go to chapter 5, 2 Corinthians. Chapter 5, 2 Corinthians. And again, if you did not hear this, you need to stop. You need to hear this message this week. Look at 2 Corinthians 5. Look at verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. I agree with what he said. I've thought for a long time, I'm not trying to sound smart and equate myself with him. Please don't misunderstand. But I have looked at the scripture and I've thought, you know what? I think I see tears in heaven. Because he doesn't say until after the millennial reign, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. I, I, I don't know how extensive that is, but the fact of the matter is, he's right. He's right. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. But if we wind up walking away from God, and, and thumbing our nose at his commands, and then, we, and then we stand before him at the Bema seat, the judgment seat for believers. This is for believers. And we think he's going to look at us and go, well, I was hoping you'd do more. Enter now into the joy of thy Lord. No, I don't think so. I think we need to understand that he's pointing out very specifically that as much as we will be we will be rewarded and judged according to the gold, silver, and precious stone. We're going to give an account for the wood, hay, and stubble. Look at what the next verse says. Knowing therefore the what? The terror of the Lord we persuade men. And I like what he said. That's not just telling other people about the terror of the Lord. And by the way, it is terror. When I stop and I think about people that are out there that if the Lord came and they wind up meeting up with the Antichrist and at first thinking, oh, you know, this is going to be so great. No, it's not. No, it's not. And then going to the great white throne judgment, that's terrifying. But to me, our God has done everything that he can do to paint a picture of himself, to help us see that when we stand before a holy God, we give an account my friend, if you sit there and say, well, at least I know I'm going to go to heaven. If you have that kind of an attitude about God and about what he has done for you, are you sure? Did you take, did you take God that seriously when you realized that you were a sinner and you needed saved from your sin? And just simply praying a prayer doesn't do it. There's something that needs to take place inside. There needs to be something, that, there needs to be a matter of trust because you have recognized you're a sinner. Now, when I say that, and I use the word repentance, some people absolutely go berserko because they think, oh, what you're saying is people have to quit sinning in order to be saved. No, you have to recognize that you're a sinner. 
And you're not always going to recognize <clears throat> certain things that they're sin. It's like I've told you know. It's like I've told you before. I've known people. They just didn't know it. We just remember. I was telling you not too long ago about the Flores family that we support. They got saved. They got wonderfully saved. I knew their pastor, Ray Batema. And one day, after, you know, they're serving the Lord and they're there at church, you know, and, and, and just, you know, having a great time. He walks up and says, wait a minute, back, back, back. You guys aren't married? And they just went, no. They got two kids and a third on the way. And they're serving the Lord. They didn't know. Well, they took care of that. Five or six years later, I'm just kidding. No, but they took care of that. And, and see, so when, when things come into, into view, Pastor Fisher, Doug Fisher, immediately, you know, he starts reading his Bible. It, it, this is how it worked with him. You know, he starts reading his Bible. First week he reads his Bible, Ed, he reads about fasting. Hey, preacher, what's this? His pastor explains it to him. Okay, that's what I'm going to do. Then he starts reading some more, and he comes across this strange word, fornication. Pastor, what's that? And he explains it to him. That's sex outside of marriage. Really? Okay. Goes home and tells his living girlfriend, you got to move out. You're gone. He did. I mean, boom, that was it. You see, it's when you're confronted with something that you recognize as sin. Hey, do you realize that bitterness is sin? Do you realize, you remember how much he talked about anger? How about apathy? Listen, I don't know if you're listening to somebody on a podcast or something. If you are congratulating yourself that you're listening to somebody on the radio or on the internet and just congratulating yourself that you're getting a bunch of head knowledge, but it's not going from the head to the heart to the hand, friend, I'm sorry, you're not impressing God, let alone me or anybody else. We are saved to serve. The service begins with glorifying God, with walking with Him. I don't know where you're at, but I can praise God for this. It's not how you start, it's how you finish. It's not how you start, it's how you finish. How many of you are glad you're not where you were when you started? Unbelievably so unbelievably. I would not have wanted to hang around me. Seriously. I, you know, it's it just that, that that's, what, that's, that's the way it is. But, here, but again, here's the point. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. You know, you know what by God's grace is? You know, you know what my ministry is and ought to be? And I don't do a good job at it, but God's, by God's grace I want to. You see, You're going to stand before God. We just read it. My job is to get you to understand and realize that and to guide you and help you to understand that you need to get home. You need to get into the Word of God. You need to ask the Lord, Lord, where are my gifts? You just don't simply take a test. Oh, that's that's really interesting. I have the gift of gab. (laughs) What you do is you just start moving ahead. And sometimes you do start at vacuuming. Sometimes you do start at ushering. Sometimes you do start. Let me tell you something. I praise God for a good usher. That fellow right back there is the best head usher I have ever seen. He really is. He has served his Lord. That doesn't mean he's he's any better looking. By the way, you know what's great? You know what's great? Tuesday night, one of his classmates is going to be here. He and Dr. R graduated together. I don't know who I want to gossip on first. No, it, it, it'll, 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 what's that? <laughs> there you go. But really, folks, look. <clears throat> these walls, listen, listen to me. We do not come in here. We do not come into this building and get comfort because of the craziness that's going on on the outside. We don't come in and go, oh, we're finally in a sane place. Number one, I don't think this is a sane place. And it's not my fault. 
It's norms. <laughs> I saw you just getting ready to lean over and say something to Julie, brother. I caught you. I, I, I beat you to it. <laughs> no, but seriously, you know, what, you, you know what we're here for? We're here to keep falling in love with Jesus. We're here to learn his word. We're here to encourage each other. Because we're going to need it when we get out there. I praise God for people that just step up. You know, it's just, it's not that, you know, not that big of a deal. The Atkinsons, hey, got college kids coming. Hey, we'll keep them at our house. Praise God, I can't keep them at my house. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, just, 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 just little things. You know, but, but the, the point is, is just, you know, I, I'm safe. You see that, you see that sign back there above the map? The sun never sets on a missions-loving church because these flags literally around the world, by the way, I want you to know the youngs, they really want prayer right now because they're concerned. They, they know some people. There's a picture with them of some folks that have been told they have to leave. Not the youngs, but somebody else, and they're saying, please, you know, pray. But I rejoice. The money that you give in Faith Promise goes to these ministries that are around the world while we're rejoicing in the fact that they're going around the world, like the Philippines, right, brother? While they're going around the world, meanwhile, we're still trying to punch holes into how we can reach next door. It was so funny. Vivian Green, the other night, comes over to our house after the service. We needed help. Uh, just, you know, just what mom's going through and stuff. Well, this next door neighbor that we're trying to reach, who is Filipino, this next door neighbor, she comes in late. She's a nurse too. So what, does they, what do they do? They start talking Tagalog. As far as I know, they're speaking in tongues. I do not understand it. <laughs> but she, came, she got her over, and she's helping out. And she says, now you need to come to church. You know, there are some of you, you can get away with stuff that I can't get away with. Number one, I'm old. Number two, I'm white. Number two, I'm a guy. Some of you, you're much better at it. But the thing is, is you can do it. You can do it. So again, my, 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 point, is, my point is this. Look, you might be thinking about going for a job interview, but that's not the most important interview you're going to have in your life. It's going to be what we just read about in 2 Corinthians 5. You might be thinking about, hey, I'm going to have to face somebody. We've got a problem. Please, pr please pray for me. Yeah, we'll do that. But that's not your worst situation. That's not the most challenging situation, I should say. You're going to stand before Christ. And you're going to see, yes, your sins are under the blood, but there's gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, and stubble. There are things good and evil evil. Does that mean you're going to give an account of that pornography that you look at or the anger or the hate or all that? Wood, hay, stubble. I don't know about you, but I want to, I, I want to keep short accounts with the Lord. I want to keep short accounts with the Lord. So folks, listen, we're going to go to prayer because I got to go home. We're going to go to prayer. But please, un understand this. Th all of this is about, yes, us encouraging each other, but recognizing we are going to stand before him. I am terrified. That's why, you know, I want to I wanna ask him, Lord, for, you know, forgive me. When I think about, you know, 26 years here now, and I look back and I think, oh, my soul, there's stuff I could have done so much better. And, and you, you, know, you might think of these things. Don't let it discourage you. Just understand, like I said, it's not how you start. It's how you finish. Let's go to prayer. Yeah.